Greetings. This is the commentary and sermonette on the song, Violating Your Love. In my notes, I have this as song number 94. Now, as far as me uploading to YouTube, this is song 101. The date I have on this is November 20th, 1982. So this must have been a new song, Open C, and I think it just came together pretty much in one shot. I've done very little revision to it. I left out a few words when I've recorded it. I wanted to keep the song a little bit simpler. I think the main thrust of why I wrote this song is because the Bible is calling for obedience to a standard of living. And as unsaved people, we're living in a constant state of disobedience. Well, obedience, our nature rebels against that. And if Christianity just becomes a set of do's and don'ts and rules, regulations, laws, or some kind of legalism, I don't see how that can be sustained long term. And one of the big reasons is because if you're obeying in a legalistic, stoic kind of duty-oriented fashion, some things are going to come along that are going to knock the legs right out from under that, and a person is going to quite honestly become angry at God. So that's what happened with Job. Job had a whole standard of things, and God had blessed him because when you do obey God, even if the motives aren't right, many times there are very positive things that come as far as what the Bible teaches about how to handle money, your relationship with money, how to relate to an employer, how to relate to your government, how to relate to your children. If you do all these things, there's going to be positive consequences that normally come. But then something will come along that totally seems unjust and unfair. And that's what the book of Job is about. And that's what happened with Job. Listen to the lyrics. Have I violated your law, O God? Have I violated your word, O God? Have I violated your commands, O God? Make me to see I'm not just sinning against words but against the person, Jesus. I'm violating your love, violating your love. That's the point right there, the key. And I'm not asking God, help me to see. I'm not just sinning against words, because that's weak. You know, when we say, oh, help me, Lord, with this, help me with that, help me with that, that's a way of being this kind of, I don't know, perverted beggar. I should qualify that because there's times I've asked the Lord, you know, help, Lord. I mean, the Bible says, help, Lord. But in something like this where you know what's right or wrong and you get glimpses of it and, and then you go and help me, you know, to do this, help me to do that, that's a way of saying, I wish that I would be better and I wish everything would be okay and I wish I... And this is saying, no, make me to see. I'm not just sinning against words, but against the person, Jesus. Whatever he needs to do to me, to make me see that my sin is against the person of Jesus Christ and against him as well, because they're one, but that I'm sinning against God and I'm violating his love for me. Now, we've got to get into what love is that we're talking about, but let's go on. Now, the next verse I say, Have I offended my brother, O God? Have I offended my sister, O God? Have I offended even the least of them, O God? Make me to see that they are your body and were members of one another, so I'm also hurting me, grieving the heavenly dove, violating your love violating your love these are really good lyrics i gotta say <laughs> now i want to go through this one a little bit more carefully you know he talks about offending your brothers and offending your sisters and offending even the least of them it'd be better if a millstone was tied around his neck and cast the sea than make one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble so my point here is i have these brothers and sisters and i'm kind of saying have i offended them almost like I don't really want to live worried about if they're all offended. Maybe that's what I'm saying. When I originally wrote this, here's kind of where I was coming from. Have I offended my brother, O oh God? 
maybe by censoring him, his priesthood thus denying. So in other words, rather than listening to a brother who's coming to me, I just dismiss him and I'm denying the priesthood he has. He can receive a message directly from God. I've offended him just because I don't let him speak. Have I offended my sister, O God? Maybe by not treating her with all purity, stirring up stuff in her, maybe. Have I offended even the least of them, O God, except maybe by intimidation? And why would that factor in? Well, listen to this. When Paul was talking about the makeup of the true church of God, he says, Consider your calling, brethren. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not that he might nullify the things that are that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, that being set apart, and redemption. Boy, this is a powerful passage. That just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you're going to brag about someone, brag about the Lord and what he's done, who he is, how he's worked in your life. He's the one. This passage is saying, look around and see who God's gotten hold of. Bunch of misfits. Now, he doesn't want us to stay in this dilapidated kind of condition. He wants us to become strong in the Lord. He wants us to become united in the faith. He wants us to become an effective witness for him. So have I offended even the least of them? But again, when I come through these things of the brother, sister, and even the least of them, make me to see, don't help me see, make me to see they're your body. And we're members of one another, so I'm also hurting me, grieving the heavenly dove, violating your love, violating your love. Now's when I go into a middle part. I love the music part of this. And the other thing I do want to say, I wish I had a bunch of soprano singers, I don't know, doing this violating your love, singing all that in the background, see, instead of just me, but it is what it is right now. So in this bridge or center part or whatever you want to call it, make me to see faith's priority. Make me to know faith's primary goal, which is what? Faith works through love. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Not through rules, not through laws. To the hearing ear, love is faith's call. Love is faith's call. Then I have some things I just say. And I can see how people would disagree with this theologically. Because I say the Bible's theme is to gain and maintain relationships on the foundation of love. First with God, then with our fellow man. Now, some people might say, no, no. It's to gain and maintain relationships on the foundation of faith. Well, that's true. But in a minute, we're going to see that faith works through love. Love fulfills the law. Love exceeds the requirements of the law. Love goes the second mile. The hearing ear hears. Love is faith's call. Faith is the call to believe in the Lord. But see, the demons also believe and shudder. Because what's missing is love. They believe that God is one. But they hate God. And they hate everything about Him. Faith working through love. Listen to this. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That's what matters. Not faith working through laws, rules, regulations, do's, don'ts, a self-righteousness, or duty-driven, 
I almost call it a militant or militaristic type Christianity where it's obey, 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 obey based on rules and laws and bylaws and or this system we set up of what Christianity is. Faith is not to be working through that stuff. Now, a lot of people do that and a lot of churches do that. Faith is to be working through love, not through law, not through rules, not through do's and don'ts. Faith working through love. So what is this love we're talking about? What is love? And it is the word here, agapeo. And that word means to place value on something or someone because of a perceived intrinsic worth. The best way to think of it, if you're going to boil agape down to one word, I think the word should be respect. Respect towards someone or something. You can have a lesser amount of respect or a greater amount of respect. When Jesus went to Simon the Pharisee's house, the woman came in and she was weeping and washing his feet with tears. And this Simon said, look, if he knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And Jesus said, Simon, I got a question for you. Let's say you got somebody that owes someone $5 and another person owes them a million dollars. Both of them have been forgiven. Which one do you think, Simon, will love more? And that's the word agape. And he says, well, I suppose the one that's forgiven a million. Yeah, you're right, Simon. See this woman? You didn't even bother to wash my feet when I came in. She hasn't stopped washing my feet with her own tears since I came in. And this woman, whose sins are many, the one who's forgiven much, the same loves much. I've not come to call righteous, but sinners. The point is, there are degrees of this love or respect, and it can be devotion as well. And it can, it can involve feelings, but it doesn't have to. And here's where you're going to see why. To get another definition of agapeo, faith working through love, Paul says, look, if I speak with the tongues of men, I think that'd be any known language, and of angels, Maybe that's what the other tongues is. But do not have love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, just noise. Bashing noise. It's just offensive. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. I can be this super spiritual know-it-all, but if I don't have respect, placing value on these people around me, and my arrogance because I'm so brilliant, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, I'm going to give it all away. It's all Korban. It's all been devoted to God. And if I deliver my body to be burned, I'm ready to go to the stake and die for you. Right, Peter? but do not have love, it profits me nothing. See, faith, yes, faith, yes, faith, yes. But faith working through love, not through rules, not through laws, not through all of these things that are listed, all these gifts, all this knowledge, knowing all these mysteries, all these insights, faith to remove mountains, I can have all that stuff. I can give everything away, not keeping any possessions, deliver my body even to be burned. But if I do not have love, agape, it profits me nothing. So what is agape? What is it? What is this love? Oh, here it is. Agape is patient. Agape is kind and is not jealous. It does not brag and is not arrogant. Let's look at those right quick. Being patient. Do I have to have a bunch of feelings to be patient with somebody? No, I don't have to have any feelings. What I need to do is rebuke myself and be patient with that person instead of so judgmental because they're not living up to the rules and regulations and whatever I've decided they need to do. Patient. In other words, give them elbow room. To be kind. Well, okay, I can open the door for an enemy. I can be kind. I can be patient with an enemy. I can not be jealous of an enemy. I cannot brag 
around an enemy and not be arrogant towards an enemy. That has nothing to do with warm, gushy feelings towards them. That is rebuking myself of my own motives of how I'm relating to them. Sometimes it's seen, sometimes it's more internal, I don't even see it. But if I've got these attitudes and these things, I need to rebuke myself, get myself in line, and I will be practicing agape love then. It has nothing to do with any feelings. Agape does not act unbecomingly or rude. Well, I can do that. I can rebuke myself and not be a rude person, interrupting them and dismissing them and rolling my eyes at them or whatever else. Love does not seek its own. I can start thinking more in their interests. I don't have to have any feelings for them, but I can rebuke myself and maybe listen to them. Is not provoked. That has nothing to do with having warm, gushy feelings towards anybody. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. That's not warm, gushy feelings either. In other words, if I get wronged, I overlook it. God help us to where we don't keep those kind of scores. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. What does that have to do with warm, gushy feelings towards anybody? But love rejoices with the truth. Whatever the truth is, you rejoice with it. That has nothing to do with any feelings towards anybody. Agape, I'm expressing love, agape love, God's definition, when I'm rejoicing with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. Give people the benefit of the doubt. You don't jump to these conclusions because you heard something about them. That one bears all things, it could mean protects or covers. Hopes all things. As long as someone's still breathing, there's a chance they can turn to the Lord. Endures all things. Love, agape, never fails. I want you to look at this list, think on this list, go through this list. This is what agape is. And faith works through that. Through me not bragging, through me not being arrogant towards others, through me not taking into account a wrong that suffered. You go through that list and faith is to work through that activity, not faith working through a bunch of rules that I've set up or some church has set up. So that's what my song here is about. I hope I'm explaining that right. Love fulfills the law. The law is right, the law is holy, the law is pure. Jesus came and fulfilled the law, but now love itself fulfills the law. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor, or a different one, it's hetero, which we do heterosexual, which means different sex. For he who loves a different one has fulfilled the law. Another place is, you know, you love your neighbors yourself. That when you do that, which means respect for and treating them in all these ways, you're automatically fulfilling the law. You're already doing it. Faith is to work through love where it's a genuine respect. And what I'm convinced of, in fact, I know this because of my own experience. As I started practicing that on people around me, giving them the room they need to be who they are, then God has honored that by showing me things about them strengths they have, gifts they have, abilities they have, and all of a sudden you do go into an endearment towards that person, not all the time, but many times, and then you'll even think about them and it'll be these warm feelings. Because you had respect for them, God will open your eyes to things to where that's where phileo love comes into the picture, means a cherishing of people. It's got to be an agape first and it can grow into phileo. Phileo is built on agape love, but that is the emotion part of love. It's translated sometimes to kiss, or in the noun form, kiss, or in friend, phileo and philos. So agape, though, is the foundation of it all, which means a genuine, deep respect. And the primary way of respecting people is knowing they're made in the image of God. They've defiled all those images, but those images are still there. And that's part of God getting hold of people and beginning to reverse the defilement of these qualities and traits that he has shared with us to where we begin to function in them more correctly. That's the whole point of Christianity. And sanctification means that we're getting those areas more and more cleaned up. Our speech, our thinking, our planning, 
our creativity, all these things God will address to where they get cleaned up. Well then, I go into the first verse again, and I add some little statements. Have I violated your law, O God? Laws written on tablets of stone. Like, who cares? Have I violated your word, O God? Words written on paper with ink. Whoopee. Have I violated your commands, O God? Just do's and don'ts. Don't reason, don't think. See, I'm, I'm putting the Bible and everything that God tells us in here as just these sterile demands of righteousness. So is that what this is all about? That's what I violated when I don't do those things? Make me to see. God Almighty, make me to see. I am not sinning against words, but against the person, Jesus. These violations of what are righteous laws, righteous word, righteous command, these violations are sins against him. So make me to see that I'm not just sinning against words, but against the person who died to pay for all of those things, Jesus violating his love. I am betraying him. I am putting more on him as I continue to sin. Make me to see to where I just decide I don't want to sin anymore. Like some of my songs. I don't want to keep sinning no more against you. Blessed Lord Jesus, no more a whoring away from you. I don't want to keep sinning no more. Mel Gibson's movie, Work of Christ, or crucifixion of Christ. Gosh, I can't believe I can't think of the name of it. When Jesus was getting scourged, man, I just wanted to fall down. I said, God, I don't want to sin against you anymore. This cost you beyond anything I can know or imagine. So when we get glimpses of who we're sinning against and what he has done, we understand we're violating his love. And that's what this song is about. Christianity is a relationship with God, not a religion. I also want you to read another article I have. I've referred to it several times. It's called Cherishing Jesus in the Bible. Because this is the heart of Christianity. It is the person of Christ. And our sins are against Him. And He suffered and died to pay for those things. And He wants us to leave off. Because we respect Him. We repent appreciate what he's done and hopefully and what needs to grow is a cherishing of him that relationship will then have the ability to withstand great injustices and troubles that come in this life i wrote something down the other night i was thinking of a lot of the international friends that god has brought into my life and some of them are not interested in him at all and and i just said lord death is going to overtake them at some point in this age. Death will come. I'm trusting you to grant them life before the death of this life can take them. I need you to intervene because right now I've met them here and I don't know what all is going to go on in their life, but there's going to be a point where they die. And they may be ignoring you right now and going along. And Lord, if you don't intervene before that point, then death is going to take them. And I'm asking for you to intervene and grant them life to where when that comes, they go into life. Well, I want to close with that. I hope this has made sense to you. I want you to think on these things. Our faith works through love. That's how it's supposed to go forward. Thank you for listening. Like I always say, listen to these matters, you're gonna learn great and mighty things that you have not known and have not even entered your mind and will always end in life. You will indeed live.